Hello, my name is Luis Rivera and I'm coming to you with the Sunday School lesson for December 4th. And the Sunday School lesson is called, God Promises a Savior. And we'll be taking our text from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And I'm going to read right now. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a, a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his, da of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath con also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. Who was called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And the key verse is verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this Sunday school lesson today, God. We thank you, Lord God, for making promises and being able and being powerful enough, O oh God, to fulfill your promises. We thank you, O oh God, that you are not a man that you should lie, neither the son of man that you should repent. We thank you, O oh God, for everything in you, O oh God. Every promise and every good thing, O oh God, in you, O oh God, is, is a matter of yea and amen, O oh God. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your mercy towards us, O oh God. You know, God, give us understanding, insight, Lord God, revelation, O oh God, knowledge, O oh God, in your word, that we may, hallelujah, give you glory and praise your name. O oh God, even your name, Jesus, hallelujah, which verse 31 in this lesson, O oh God, is revealed. We thank you, Jesus, for the name Yeshua. We thank you, Jesus, O oh God, that you are our salvation and you have been sent, O oh God, hallelujah, to Save us from our sins, O oh God. Save us from the wrath of God. We give you all the glory and honor that's due to your name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Right off the back, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Mentions, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel. And so we see this, this, um, this time frame already in the sixth month. And this has a lot to do with with um with Zechariah and Elizabeth and their child uh, having a baby. And so verse 26 it says in the sixth month is directly related, related to that conception, to John's conception. And God God sent Gabriel. Now, when we think about all these names that are being touted now because we have a, a, a author by the name of Luke who's a physician he's very very uh, meticulous he's a very uh, scientific person he's a very um, very thorough historian and we see this not only in, in Luke the gospel according to Luke but we also see that in the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Ghost and so we see this, this meticulous writing and how he's very thorough. And everything that he says is not without, not without importance. 
And so when he talks about the sixth month and also names like Gabriel or name the name of Nazareth, the city, or even the name Mary, or even the, the idea of the house of David, all these things are going to have very specific meanings. So when, they, when, you, when we come across them, I'm going to explain to you why they're, they're very significant. And so right off the bat, again, um, at this point, uh, Elizabeth has been over five months pregnant. And she, received, and she received this blessing from the Lord that the Lord opened up her womb. And now, according to that time, that time frame, Gabriel comes to her. And, she, and he even mentions it later on. And he says, verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. This is, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And we also see why that was mentioned uh, when we get to that. But let's look at the, the name Gabriel. Gabriel, I looked up, was man of God. And then I looked up even further that it meant warrior of God. And so when we think about what's going on in this particular chapter and what, what, what God is doing, even, uh, even in the title of our lesson, God Promises a Savior, there was a lot of things promised in the Old Testament as a, re as a result of, uh, of the human fall, as a result of sin in, in the earth, you know, as a matter of all, um, even within the Jewish custom, the Jewish people, um, they had a kingdom that was split into two. And even those two kingdoms fell and were no more. And so a lot of the things that had happened to those people and to humanity in general came not without, without some hope and some promise of future um, redemption. And so God makes promises, but one promise in particular that he makes a promise of is that he's going to send someone, send a savior. And so we're going we're gonna to all look into that as we go on. Uh, let's look at the, uh, before we go on to verse 26 again, uh, let's look at the key verse. The key verse says, And behold, thou, meaning Mary, shall conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And so, why is this so, so uh, significant as far as prophecy is concerned? And when we look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, which I'm going to read, I'll probably go to, on to that again and again. Isaiah chapter 9. Very familiar Christmas scripture. We often quote it. But um, it's a good, it's a good um, companion to this scripture in uh, Luke chapter 1 verse 26. Uh, chapter 31. Chapter 1 verse 31. And so Isaiah 9 and 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And I'm going to stop right there. Because in that regard, we already see that, that Mary, thou Mary, shall conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Now, is the, the wording is very, is very um, is intriguing to me because... If you're speaking to a woman about her own child, you would say, oh, and bring forth your son and bring forth your son. In this case is not so. Uh, and she, she very, um, because Luke is very meticulous, again, is pinpointing the idea that Mary is simply a vessel for God to use to bring forth a son, and a son is referring to 9-6 Isaiah, because uh, God himself has uh, said that he would come himself, and we also see a lot of scriptures um, dealing with that, and so we, we have to rightly divide the word of truth, 
by putting things together and putting things in, in right context. And so when we look at 9 verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And so what's born, what's brought forth is a child. And the child is, is Mary's child. But the son is not Mary's son. In the, in the um, I hate to, it, it's really more complicated than I'm, I'm actually conveying. But she's going to bring forth a child that is lent to her. And where we see this idea of lent uh, when we look at when we look at um, Hannah in Samuel chapter one, it talks about how Hannah she could not conceive, and when she finally did conceive, um, she she merely lent her son to the Lord and to, you know into the Lord's temple for the Lord's service. Lent meaning pretty much um, gave her son physically to them as adopted into the temple and for the temple service. And so she lent her son. But in this case, this is not a son that, that, uh, that she, can, she can say was her doing. If it were her doing, then it would not be an immaculate conception. And so this is this is where I'm coming from, is that sh there was no involvement of human flesh in bringing forth this son, but that which was brought forth, that holy thing, that child, was brought forth by the Holy Ghost. And so, uh, so it's very it's very careful wording, but it's is uh, meticulously pointing towards. Isaiah 9 chapter verse uh, chapter 9 verse 6. And so we see also more about this young man, this boy, this Jesus. And it says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace shall uh, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so what's going on is the zeal of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, he's performing it, meaning God is doing this. And even Gabriel says it says that in not so many words. And he says, um, let's see, because I'm, I'm going to jump around within the chapter. He says, and the angel said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, verse 35, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God, shall be called the Son of God. And we also see in other places where the Son the title son is 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 more a title than it is uh, something that you know what we relate to as our children for us a son and so we see in uh John chapter 1 verse 14 and in parentheses and it says and it says and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And so what we see in parentheses is a simile, is as of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus is truly the Son of God. But the, in essence, the Son of God is the Word of God. I've been saying this uh, for weeks on end, and this is what, what is meant by the Son of God. The Son of God for us is, so that we may relate is something that we care about dearly. Our children, we care, we love our children dearly. And so God spoke his word and his word became flesh. And the word that became flesh was called the son of God. And this is what, what, it, said, what it said here in, in verse 35 of today's lesson. 
that this this holy that holy thing Jesus that that child he shall be called the son of God and that also uh, coincides with chap John chapter 1 verse 14 and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth and so don't get me mistaken I'm, I'm not teaching no heresy Jesus is the son of God Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus is everything that he says he was uh, he is in scripture. Jesus is God manifest in flesh. All these things we understand through rightly dividing the word of truth and not just not just merely just reading and glossing over over what we're reading, but let's be very careful in what we're reading because even Luke is careful in how he writes these things. He's very careful to put one and one together to make two. And so we, we, we just can't gloss over scripture. And so um, that's an idea. That's the idea of Isaiah 9, verse 6 through 7, that it coincides with this particular key verse, verse 31. And also let's look at Matthew chapter 20, chapter 1, Verse 20 through 24. I'm all messed up. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 through 24. But while he thought on these things, and he's talking about Joseph. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and that thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22 says, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, in verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And so we see there that it's a callback uh, to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That, you know, we shall call him Emmanuel. Well, in the same breath, the, the angel is telling him to call the child Jesus and in the same breath, he's saying that this is well, what, what is fulfilled in the prophets or in the prophet Isaiah, in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that you shall call him, him Emmanuel, which is interpreted, God is with us. And so what is this that we're saying of Jesus? Jesus is God with us. Jesus is not just some mere child, uh, some you know, baby, uh, uh, you know, that just came out for out of a woman through human, through human deed. No, this was done by God. The zeal of the Lord performed it. The Holy Ghost overshadowed her. And that which was born in her is from God Almighty. And God Almighty is the one who is revealing himself. Uh, he is manifesting himself. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is manifest. And so this is a direct fulfillment of God's promise that he would send a Savior. And so what else do we know about names? I was about to mention Gabriel, but before we went, went there, I wanted to mention, first mention Jesus. And why would, why, if in the same breath, Jesus is called Emmanuel, you know, according to the, uh, to, according to the uh, prophecy. Emmanuel meaning God with us. He gives us a definition. Then it's just as important as uh, understanding what, what Jesus' name means also. Because whatever Emmanuel means to this child, Jesus also means to this child. And so if Emmanuel is God with us, that means whatever Jesus is, is that with us. And so what does Jesus mean? Jesus means Yahweh is our salvation. 
And so we call him Yeshua. Yeshua is, uh, just is a short way of saying Yahweh is our salvation. So what is being said is that Yahweh is with us to save us. And so this is how we this is how we put the scriptures together because th this is no um, is no coincidence. These scriptures are being placed together, and the meanings of these things for this one person means that that God is with us and He has come to save us, and that is the promise of the Savior. That's in short, and and I, I kind of want to just go through a couple of scriptures too. I normally do this. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse, uh, I'm going to read 10 through, 10 through 12. Isaiah 43, 10 through 12. But the focus is verse 11. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God form, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And see verse 11 again. It says that in the, in the latter clause, it says, And beside me there is no Savior. And then verse 12, he says, I have declared... And have saved. And so who is going to save us? Yahweh himself is going to save us. And how is he going to do that? By presenting himself into our world in human flesh. Now why do we suppose he's going to present himself in human flesh? Well, it's because of that thing called the throne. And I'm, I'm not going to touch on that right at the moment until we get to verse 26. And so let's look at Isaiah 45. This is just a uh, second scripture I'm going to share with you. Isaiah 45, verse 21 through 23. And it says, Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who have declared this from ancient time? Who have told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. And so we see in very direct, very poignant language that Yahweh himself, a jealous God, I got to add, because he does say this in other places too, that he's a jealous God and he will have no other God from, uh, before him none beside him. And when he's talking about a savior, there is no help that the father, Yahweh father needs because he himself is going to be our savior. And so uh, let's look at another one. Uh, Hosea 13 verse 4. Hosea Chapter 13, verse 4. It says, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Savior beside me. And so with, with very direct language, the prophets, both Isaiah and Hosea says that there is, that he is the Savior, and besides him, there is no other Savior. That he doesn't need help in that regard. And so he himself is going to do this. The zeal of the Lord has performed this. And so now we're going into verse uh, 26. And the name Gabriel, and I mentioned already that it means a man of God, warrior of God. And so what's so significant about sending this type of angel to a little old, little old girl, 14, 15 year old girl. I'm not really sure how old she is, but she is very young. And she's a spouse to a, 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 a one man named Joseph. And there is no wars going on. 
there's no seemingly there is no war going on. There's no turmoil. There's no no earth quaking. No no uh, no earth shattering news about you know you know the the enemy is coming over the line and they're gonna they're gonna be attacked. No, but this angel, which is by definition the warrior of God, he comes to make pretty much a um. And I want to say this very carefully. He comes to wage a war. And that maybe you haven't seen this in the way that I'm about to show you. And so just follow me. Follow along. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. And we're going to see why Jesus even came to this world that we live in. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You see, this is the purpose the Son of God was manifested, to destroy the works of the devil. And so, where do we get this idea? What? Well, where is this war coming from? Where is this attack? Why, why is Gabriel coming to put inside of this, this, this child's mind that she's going to be the mother of a child who's going to be raised up a king and that he's going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings, that great things are going to happen because of him, that he is made from the, 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 from the highest. And that what is the purpose of this? Is because he's destroying the works of the devil. And so where does this war cut on start? Let's look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, this most Bible scholars would go down this avenue, and this is um this is just makes sense because this is the reason Jesus was born. And so remember after the fall that uh Mary uh, that Mary that Eve took of the fruit that was forbidden and she ate it and she gave it to her husband, Adam, and he did eat it and both of them ate it and they were both, you know, um, judged by God. And so in verse 15, it talks about the, the, the devil who was in the form of a serpent and how God is cursing the serpent at this moment in verse 15. He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so we see that this is the declaration of war that the devil has waged against God in, in uh, subverting Adam and Eve and making them, not making them, but uh, suggesting to them that, you know, God's word is not all what it's cracked up to be. He suggested to them that God's word is not exactly what he said. And so he, he, he made God a liar in the mind of Eve and Adam. And they went ahead and did take the fruit uh, of the knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes were open, uh, and they became and they became and they became um, aware of themselves and aware of you know certain strengths and and power and and you know things you know things that was not so uh, so important to an innocent child, but now it seems to be a very important and very important one to make one wise. One to, to make one smart. One to make one, um, you know, better than they were before. Where they weren't, they weren't bad at all to begin with. And so even God says, well, who told you that you were naked? And so I'm going, I don't want to go too far into that. But that's where the war is waged. This is the war that I'm talking about. And Gabriel is sent in a specific time in a specific location to a specific person 
to a specific household. And why is this so specific? Because it already mentioned, I already mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, that Joseph was, uh, was a man um, of Davidic background. And so even if we were to regard his lineage, he would be of Davidic background and his son would be heir to the throne. Very likely. Also, Mary is of Davidic background, and it means that her son would be heir to the throne. And so the throne is very important. These are things that are intertwining. There are promises that are intertwining. Promises to be saved. Promises of a, 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 the earthly king, the kingship to be you know, re redeemed again and made new through one person called the Savior, the Messiah. And so let's look at Luke chapter 10, the, the same author, but later on in his own works, Luke chapter 10. Verse 18 through 24. So we see that his, the purpose of the Son of God was to destroy the works of the devil. And that there, the devil had waged war. And God uh, pronounced judgment on the devil. Made a promise. Now when he speaks his word. He said that you know, your seed shall be. Um, uh, I don't even want to um, mess that up. I don't want to mess that up. 3.15 I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And so even from that point on, the devil had seed and the woman had seed. The devil's seed is everyone who is workers of iniquity. You know, uh, they, they work transgressions. They, they do wrong. They do everything according to their own way. But the seed of the woman is very specific in that it means seed as in one. And we see this idea uh, Paul teaches us in Galatians, how he, how he sees the seed. That there is not more than one seed, but is pertaining to one particular person, in, uh, very specifically Jesus. And so the seed is Jesus. And so all of his, all of Satan and his seed makes war with the woman and her seed. And so we see this in, uh, in history, how that during even Moses' time, that they destroyed all the children at that time because they, they knew that there were going to be a deliverer come up. And that God was going to deliver them some kind of way. And it was going to be through a, a male child. And that they, he, was going to be, he was going to be a great no, notable person. A Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer, a Judge himself. And they killed all the children of, the, of, the, uh, of, those day, of that day in Egypt. Then we fast forward to here in today's lesson where Herod... Himself, the king of, of, of Rome or the king of the province of that area, he's saying, Oh, bring me that child, bring me all the children, you know, that, that are born you know, during these times, and, and look for his star. I, if I remember the story correctly, look for his star and follow that star, and wherever that star leads you, and if there's a child at the end of that star, where you go. Bring him to me so that I can worship him too. And you know that old fox was thinking, you know, no, I'm not going to worship him. Of course, I'm going to take that child and dash him into pieces. I'm going to kill that child. And so we see war against the seed of God, the seed of the woman throughout all generations. And in this one is particular. Now we see the seed of a woman, Mary being that woman. Mary being a specific person within the tribe of, of, of Judah, who is of the lineage of David, who is an uh, Israelite, indeed, a child of Jacob. And so all of this is all coming in intertwining and is all in line. 
And so look at chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. I didn't get it, did I? Verse 18 through 24. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is, but the Father, and who the Father is, but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, to hear those things that you hear, and have not heard them. And so this whole idea of Jesus seeing Satan fall from, the, fall from heaven, this is another attack. Why? Because he came to give us power, to save us and to give us power, to deliver us from, our, from, the, from the bondage of sin and also to destroy the works of the devil. And anything that the devil has done as far as um, binding people, you know, uh, stealing from people, all these things that, that, that are contrary to God's spirit and God's way of being, his godliness, holiness, all those things that are contrary, Jesus came to be the exact opposite and to counter that attack. And that counter began with a little lady called Mary and Gabriel, the man of war, the, the warrior of God. Who came to wage this war and to and to show them the way? Uh, how do I know this kind of these kind of things? Okay, look at Hebrews. I might have to look for it real quick. I know where it is. Look at Hebrews, chapter one, verse fourteen, and we're gonna see what a, 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 a angel and what their purpose is. It says, and are they not all ministering? Are all are they not all ministering spirits? Talking about angels, send forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Now, Gabriel is not there to wage war with his own hands, or to strike anyone himself. I mean, any one angel can do very much damage to this earth. But God did not send an angel to do that, but to lead and to guide us into salvation so that we ourselves can be delivered from the works of, from the, works of the devil and also empowered. And see uh, chapter 10, verse 19 through 24, all that power given to us to destroy the works of the devil. And so we see uh, what the purpose of the Son of God was was to actually save us and to empower us to destroy the works of the devil. And so this is a, 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 a this is a war a wartime act for Gabriel to come to Mary and to inform her what was going to happen to her and what God is going to do, do to, through her. And all that needed to happen was that she be a willing vessel which she was indeed. And then that was probably the main reason why she was, was chosen to begin with, because she would be such a willing vessel. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We're still, be, we're still dealing with verse 26, but uh, I'm bringing out a couple of scriptures to bear out all this. Chapter 11. Verse 12 through 13. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Okay. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. 
and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And so we see even Luke. Now, Luke is very specific in that he says, and in the sixth month, because six months is dealing with Elizabeth's birth, which is John the Baptist. And so it's very significant when you start reading scriptures from somewhere else concerning John the Baptist and what the kingdom of heaven was under attack with, what kind of bombardment was going on. It says here, and from the days of John the Baptist, beginning from the days of John the Baptist, meaning when he was born. Let's listen to this. From the days of John the Baptist until now, talking about when Jesus is speaking at this moment, until now the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And so we see the significance again. Excuse me. In verse 26, how, how uh, in this lesson, it, uh, Gabriel is talking about, well, not Gabriel, Luke is talking about in the sixth month, which is directly related to Zechariah and Elizabeth and John's conception. Now let's move on. Um, another one of those things I uh, just want to throw out there, Nazareth. Nazareth, the, the, the meaning of the word Nazareth is the guarded one. And so... Let's look also in other scriptures what Nazareth mean to other people. And remember how in Isaiah, he says, I do this thing before it even come to pass. And I do it. Uh, and Jesus even said it in, in not so many words, like he prayed this to the father. He says, I, I thank God that you've done this and have kept this from the wise and the prudent and have put, put this stuff under the radar. But look what it says, what other people think about Nazareth. Remember the idea of in Nathaniel, Nathaniel actually said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And so they were not expecting anything as far as prophetic coming from Nazareth, let alone anything good. Because it was kind of like ghetto. It was like Camden, New Jersey, North New Jersey, um, uh, Chi-Town, uh, Illinois. Uh, what's another bad city of I mean, Compton, LA? You know, it was a bad city. No for, notoriety was uh, was gang violence. Notoriety was poverty. You know, everything about this city was just bad. It was ghetto, and nothing was good to come out of it. And so, God did this strategically and placed Jesus under a ra under the radar. And so even when Herod was looking for this child, this child, he could not get the child because everything was done in secret. And it was out in the open, but in secret. This is what amazes me about God is that he can inform us about something that he is definitely going to do. But he can keep it from those that would try to harm that, that, that plan. And so God is just um, awesome like that. He's strategic. Um, that idea came from um, John chapter 1, verse 46. Nathaniel says, um, can any good thing come from Nazareth? And so let's look at verse 27. And the idea in verse 27, the virgin is espoused to a man whose name is Joseph of the house of David. Let's deal with the house of David real quick. Not only the virgin idea, but the house of David. Those two different concepts are found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Isaiah 7, verse 13 and 14. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so we see the concept of the house of David and also the sign of the virgin. And so it says to a virgin espoused to a man whose name is Joseph 
of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Here's another name for you. Mary. Anyone knows what that name means? You'll be very surprised uh, if you don't know. It means rebellion. It means their rebellion. And so what in the world could little innocent good Mary, because she was, she was innocent. She was a, a, a very good person. She was a very willing vessel that God chose, and she was a very kind person. From, from what I gather from Mary is that she was, she was the, the epitome of, of a great, and this is for lack of a better term, for being a great tool for the Lord. Being a great vessel, being a great, being of great use, and a person of great use is always someone who is always obedient, always uh, very open and 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 apt to hear what thus saith the Lord is, and not only hear but be a doer of the word too. And so, look at what Mary means, Miriam, their rebellion. It means rebellion. And so what about her life can be a rebellion? What about it? Now, I pose two, th two things. Two things, one being the most obvious, that it is rebellious for nature to say in nature that a woman or even any living thing can be impregnated by a spirit can be impregnated um, miraculously the way she was. Because we know by science, we know by common sense, we know just by human nature, human history, that a man and a woman, they get together and they do something and they conceive a child. It doesn't happen any other way. It doesn't happen with a man and a man a woman and a woman, a group of people, a think tank, you know, um, a whole bunch of other stuff. It, it, you need what a man has to offer to put into what a woman has to offer. And I got to put it like that because in this day and age, we have artificial insemination. We have all kinds of different ways of doing things. But it is literally what a male pr produces that goes together with what a woman produces and those two get together and you have conception of a child. There is no other way. And so for them to come up for with another way to go, go against nature, this is rebellion. And so this is a way I see uh, Mary's name coming into play. I mean, this, this, you know, I leave that up in the air. It's not all, it's not word of God. It's pretty much me, me saying what her name means, which is the truth. It means rebellion. But in what aspect or what way can we say that her name being rebellion means something to us today? And so in this aspect, her having a child without the help of flesh that is rebellion. Rebellion of the umpteenth degree. In this world, who is the God of this world? And how is everything supposed to, uh, is supposed to flow? It's supposed to flow the way it has always flowed. And for the devil to be the God of this world and to see something like that happening, he cringes in his own self. And he moves men to try to destroy babies. We see that even in uh, today's culture. Today's culture, we have uh, the idea of abortion. Abortion is murder. Abortion is nothing, nothing short of murder. There is no way we can justify the act of abortion. No way. Uh, you saving the woman... And her life, I can, I can see an argument for that. But abortion, you know, to kill out of convenience a child in the, in the womb of a mother, 
whether it be convenience, whether it be uh, because you ain't got no money or you ain't married and, you know, all these different ideas and people, you didn't go to school. Look, I'm sorry. All these excuses are not good. And we, we have the same spirit that works in today that has worked throughout all generations. That the devil has, uh, has waged a war on potential life-saving people. Potential life-savers. And I, and I don't mean to make this uh, 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 anti-abortion thing, but it just irks my soul to just to know that there are people that actually justify that act. And even Christians, look, I have to come against that. Christians justifying the act of abortion. I don't care if you, if you had a child out of wedlock. It does not matter. The child did not do anything worthy of death. And so we see this idea that all throughout in all generations that there's a war waged on, on potential life, the seed of a woman. And also the idea that this woman did not receive any kind of help from any man, not Joseph, to, to create a child within her womb. That is rebellion. That's outright rebellion against nature. And But this is something that God has imposed. God has done this. The zeal of the Lord has performed this. And I'm going to repeat that over and over again because when God speaks his word, he loves his word like he loves, like even any one of us loves an only begotten child. That's how much he loves his word. And so when God makes a promise, you best believe he's going to fulfill that promise. And so God made a promise that he's going to send a savior. And this savior came in a form of a sign. And what, what is sign? When we read Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, it says a sign. And when I looked it up, it means a signal, a distinguishing mark, a banner a remembrance, a miraculous sign, an omen, a warning. And we also see in other places a standard, which is a banner. It's the same word as a banner. It's a flag that you put on top of a building to say, oh, this is, this is King so-and-so's building. And so we have a standard, a sign that is set up so that all can see what has happened, who has done this, whose flag is that. And so it's a signal pole, a banner, an ensign, a flag. So God's promise of a Savior is all throughout Scripture. Look at Isaiah 59. Now I'm going to show you something in Isaiah 59. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Now jump down to verse 15. And I'm going to read to 20. Yea, truth faileth. And he that departed from evil making himself a prey. And the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no, no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. Whose arm? His arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. And so we see a very illustrative uh, text that Isaiah wrote about the arm of the Lord, how God's arm is not shortened, that it cannot save, that he himself is going to come. 
And then not only that, but it mentions that the, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard. And this is what is being lifted up because prophecy has already been spoken and God has spoken in Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 to the house of David that he's going to send a sign. And that sign was a virgin was going to conceive and bring forth a child and call that child Emmanuel. Emmanuel being interpreted God with us. And so we see, we see that uh, this, there is a war going on. And while we're looking at Christmas specials on Channel 2, Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, all the, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, all the, the, the specials that's coming on, the Christmas movies that's coming on, you know, very deck the halls, fa la 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 la, you know, spirit going on. Everybody's talking about these things, all happy, happy things. And believe me, Christmas is a happy time, yes. Uh, for those who are in the know, know that Christmas is of is of vital importance. The birth of the Savior is important, just as important as the death of the Savior, the blood of Jesus being shed on the cross, and Him rising from the grave and being taken up into glory. All of these things are very important. But you won't get... This message of this kind of war for this time of season. Remember, this is a war that Jesus came. And remember, I already uh, spoke about his purpose, that the son of God's purpose was to destroy the works of the devil. And that he also came to not only save us, but to equip us to destroy the works of the devil. And that he saw Satan fall from heaven like a lightning out of the sky and he fell into the earth. And so these things are written because the truth of the matter is that Mary is, in, is a, a, a total contradiction of what is going on in our world. She is in total rebellion against what we think of this season. When we think about Mary, we think about, and I'm talking about me as, I, as I've come to learn and come to know, Mary is a weapon that God used. And so that now when that weapon was used, the bullet that was discharged was Jesus. And that was the, that was the, the bullet that was to go into the head of Satan. And so we, we see that idea. I hope you see that illustration there. And that God has waged a war, that there was a war waged on God and that God in his own time, in his own strategy, has, has emitted a charge. And this charge is not what we think of as, you know, a warlike charge. But God has waged war with a, uh, by using a woman, utilizing a woman. And the woman was herself a gun. And in that gun was a bullet called Jesus. And we call him, we call him Yeshua. God is our salvation. Yahweh is our salvation. And so I'll get a little excited. Verse 28 and verse 29. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation it should be. And so she's confused as, as, as a regular human being. She don't know what to make of what's being said about her and what, uh, what the angel wants with her. And so it's kind of understandable for her to be the way she is. And so the angel is calming her nerves and saying, don't fear, you are you're very favored. You're in good standing you are in right standing and you're right place to be used by God. And he's about to use you. And so this goes into verse 30. <clears throat> and the angel said unto her, I read that already, didn't I? Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. In verse 31, this is our key verse again. Um, the key verse, and let me just mention it again. 
that she is a weapon of mass destruction for the enemy. Um, there is no no getting by it. Um, and, and I don't want to continue saying it, but Jesus and the purpose of the Son of God was to destroy the works of the devil. And also, this was a war that was waged in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And so, what else is happening as a result of all of this going on? Because there's a lot of promises. It's not just one promise. God promises a Savior. Yeah, but the Savior fulfills many more things than just saving people. This, the promise of the Savior, as we read in... Verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And so again, we see the idea of the throne. Let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 16. Isaiah 7 and 16. No doubt is about the throne of David. It says, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land and that, and that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And so we see, we see also the idea that why was there a need for a king? What happened to Israel's king? What happened to Israel's kings? You know, uh, you know, uh, plural. Israel, remember, was split up into two. You had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was comprised of mainly very evil kings, and they were destroyed by uh, besieged by Assyria. And they were taken in captivity. And then you had the southern kingdom, which is the kingdom of, of Judah. And these were a mixed bag. You know, there were sometimes good kings and sometimes bad kings. But eventually they, the, the word of the Lord was pronounced on them by the prophet Jeremiah that their time was up. And that they were going to go into judgment and be besieged by Nebuchadnezzar. And his army, uh, the Chaldeans. And so they were taken into Babylon. And, um, and so from that point on, they were, they were taken into the hands of, of other kings, Gentile kings. They had no king of their own. Now, this right here is saying, is saying uh, that, that he's going to restore the kingship to this child who we call Emmanuel, who we call also Yeshua, Jesus, that Yahweh is our salvation. And just like that, he's not only going to save humanity, but he's going to save Israel and save them in a way that they, they have not known since they had a king. And the last king that I remember was um, a king that had his eyes poked out and delivered into um, into Babylon. And so not since then did they have a king. And so now we have Jesus fulfilling that promise that the Davidic covenant is going to is going to be uh, is going to be um, carried out that also not just the Davidic covenant, but the Abrahamic covenant. You know, this, that says that I will bless you as the stars of the heavens, as the sand of the sea. And you, no one will be able to count you or number you because you will be so many. And you will be blessed because I blessed you, because I am your ruler. And so one thing has to happen. He had to restore himself as the monarch, God himself. Also, look at the idea, too, um, that even though they were carried away captive in, in many hundreds of years ago by Assyria and Babylon, even the current kingship that they recognized was Herod. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. Let's look at that real quick. That it's just 
the way it's written is kind of all messed up. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem. Now listen to this. Saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the, in the east and are come to worship him. And so, uh, again, they were sent by Herod so that Herod, you know, um, by, by reason of a lie, would say, you know, let me, let me find out where this king of the Jews is so I can come and worship him too. Yet, yeah, God don't play games with you, uh, Herod. And so they fled and they were gone and they were not found until King Herod had died and he, he was able to come out in the open, you know, uh, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus back to where they came from. Look at also in verse 33. Verse 33, the terminology of the house of Jacob. There's a reason why it says the house of Jacob, because remember, the house of Israel, as I said before, it was split. You had Israel as the northern kingdom, and so to not be misconstrued as the northern kingdom, he did not say the house of Israel. He would have been right in saying it, but it would have been very confusing because now you don't have Israel and Judah. Israel and Judah are gone. But how do you unify the two? How do you put together a, a, a kingdom that has fallen who used to be the, uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, and there used to be Judah, the southern kingdom? How do you unify these people in one thought? You, you call them by their name. Not Israel, but by Jacob. Because now, before any kingship was determined, before there was any King Saul, King David, King Solomon, King Rehoboam, or Jeroboam, anybody, Hezekiah, uh, uh, Jotham, or whatever, whatever king you can name, before there were any kings, they were, they were a people called by their father's name. Jacob, and that's how you unify them in one thought. And this is very important in prophecy. When you read prophecy and when you read the scripture, be keen on things like that. Uh, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And so now we have Jesus, this child that is born as matter of promise to this woman as a matter of war being waged from three from Genesis three fifteen to First John uh, three eight, this these ideas are converging, and now as a matter as a, as a result of him being born, a lot of things are coming into place. A lot of promises. God promises a savior, but what the savior brings is more than just salvation. He brings redemption. He brings healing. He brings, he brings a, a renewed covenant. He, bring, he brings um, just a renewal, a revitalization. He brings, uh, what, what's the term? I can't think of the term. Um, revival. He brings revival. And so now it's no longer the dead house of Israel, or the dead house of Judah, but now it's the house of Jacob. It's a spiritual term used for all of them altogether. And he shall reign over the whole house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there shall be no end. And we, we covered that in, in Hebrews, how, how there is no better king than Jesus. And that his, the scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Remember that in Hebrews a couple weeks back? Well, that's exactly what's going on in this promise of a Savior. Look at verse 34. This goes back also to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, And then, then said Mary unto the, uh, unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Well, it's called the sign, the token. It's, it's a miraculous thing. There's nothing you can do, Mary, to actually do anything for God. All you can do is be utilized. Be used. Uh, allow yourself to be used. Praise God. Be used. 
isn't that something we could just take with us today? We, we think that we have to put our hands to a lot of things and put our energy into a lot of things. But if we're just willing to be used and just praise God and just be used, that's a message right there in and of, its, in and of itself. And so as a matter of, 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 of a message, if you don't get anything out of today, be used. Praise God and be used. Just like that. Now, I, I, I give you all permission to steal that. You can steal it. Be used. Praise God. Be used. Amen. And so the idea goes back to 7 and 14 where it says that the, um, the sign the Lord promised was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God. And it comes to, and he says in verse 35, now we're going into verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto, him, or unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. I looked that word up, come upon, and it means to operate. The Holy Ghost came into Mary and operated. Now, what kind of operation was, was he doing? The operation was fashioning a human being on the inside of Mary, aside from the normal type of use, being rebellious to nature. <laughs> and so God, the Holy Ghost was operating on the inside and the power of the highest. Now, only one person possessed power of the highest, and that's God, Yahweh. And so it is God's power that shall envelop her, that, um, that, uh, that overshadowed her. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Look also at that. That holy thing. And that's curious language too. Why, why would Luke, a, uh, you know, obviously a believer in Jesus, say that holy thing as though it's some kind of object, uh, not human, that holy thing. That holy thing, it says, excuse me, uh, where did I get that from? That holy thing. Oh, it's the latter clause of verse 35. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Let's break that down. Because again, we, we go back uh, to verse 31 and also the idea that this this is a um, fulfillment of a prophecy found in Isaiah 9 6 and so we see that that holy thing is a child and that child is something that is to be born that is what Mary is going to do that holy thing is a child that is born he shall be called the Son of God. And guess what? That child is born. Unto us, a child is born. And then he which is called the Son of God, the Son shall be given. And so we see in direct correlation with Isaiah 9, 6, this, this, this idea that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That is in direct relationship with what is being said here. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then verse 36, which goes back to verse 26. Um, verse 36 says, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. And so why did, why did Gabriel uh, mention that at all? At all, at all. The reason he mentioned that, and I've got twofold here. First, cont contextually, it is Elizabeth's conception, which was a miracle and a sign for Mary. And so in order for Mary to really keep her, uh, her belief up, her faith up, I think the angel did have to indeed say, Look, your cousin Elizabeth, she's she's conceived already. She's about six months pregnant already. It is six months with her already. Now, 
this is something that Mary did not know previous to this uh, engagement with the with the, with the uh, angel. And I never really looked at that. I never understood that to be the case. But remember, her reaction to this is that she went to uh, to Elizabeth and, and Zechariah's house after the fact. So she obviously did not know that her cousin was pregnant. And also, what, what, what kind of tells, uh, tells me this also, look at Luke chapter 1 again. I'll show you something that you may have kind of, may have skimmed by, and somebody might be sharp enough to see it. Uh, look at verse 24, chapter 1, verse 24. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I have dealt with me in the days where he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. She hid herself. So that means that nobody knew about her pregnancy. And the twofold reason why this was a hidden thing was it could have been that uh, that that uh, that that she did not want the government to know that uh, with her that she was having a child also because maybe they understood the times too that you know Herod was trying to kill all these babies. That's just now I'm just throwing that out there. That's just conjecture. But the, another reason for her hiding herself is is pretty much um, for Mary's sake. Now I'm looking at that for Mary's sake. It says that. Um, that it, and she literally did not know, and the angel was telling her right there, live, to, and in person, verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath con also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. And this is remarkable to you because this is a miracle, and when you go ahead and verify this, you'll know that the things that we, we have discussed is true. And so later on in, in chapter one, it says that in so many words, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. So he's bracing her, bracing Mary for the idea that, look, not only has this happened many times in Old Testament, in scripture, where I opened up old women, old women's wombs or barren wombs, but I'm opening up your cousin's womb and think it not strange when God opens up your womb with the Holy Ghost overshadowing and creating by immaculate conception, a child inside of you. Think it not strange. And so that, that's pretty much what he's bracing her for. And that's why, why he even mentions it. This is like breaking news to Mary. Your cousin is also pregnant in her old age and in her barren state. Look at verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And this is one of those reasons. This is uh, probably the main reason why God chose Mary, because he knew that she would be uh, such a giving heart and giving spirit. That she would be willing to do everything that God said that, that must be done. And so she, with her words, said, Be it unto me according to thy word. But she also got, uh, got wind of her cousin and went later on. And let me look at that. I'm going to look at that and then we're going to kind of uh, close up. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 55. And I might not read all of that. And so after today's lesson, it says, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, this thing happened after the angel told her for the first time, Look, your cousin is pregnant too. And so she goes there 
the babe leaps in her womb and starts to, starts to bless Mary. And then look at verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Who does she call Savior? God, her Savior. And what is the child on the inside of her call? Emmanuel. And, and she's already been given the message. Emmanuel being interpreted God with us. If God my Savior is God my Savior, then the God that's with us that I'm naming that's on the inside of me is God my Savior. In essence, she knew. She knew eyes wide shut that the thing that was born inside of her womb is God manifest. That it is God that is about to uh, break forth out of her womb. Excuse me. But he had regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Uh, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed the strength. He has showed strength with his arm. Talking about God again and his arm. And remember, I, I recounted a couple of scriptures talking about with, in Isaiah, how is my arm too short that it cannot save? And then with his own arm, he wrought salvation unto himself. And he says, with the strength of his with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And so there you have it, the promises of God that he would send a savior, that he himself would be our savior. All of these things work in conjunction if we just understand in scripture and take, take careful thought and keen, with a keen ear, listen to what the spirit of the Lord is saying. God's promise, God promises a savior. And I hope each and every one of you that's listening to this lesson got something out of it. And that you draw from him, who is the Savior, salvation and equip, equipment so that you can fight the good fight of faith and destroy the works of the enemy. For this is a war and Mary was that weapon of mass destruction. And Jesus was the bomb. And Jesus not was the bomb. He is the bomb. And I, I say that in, in modern day colloquialism. Uh, Jesus is the bomb, y'all. And so let's praise him and give him all the glory and honor that's due to his name. In Jesus' name, God bless.